welcome to Real Life, Real Gospel. My name is Josh Laboris. I'm your host, and we are sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida. If this is your first time joining us, first of all, I would encourage you to subscribe, whether that be on Spotify, on YouTube, on Podbean, on Google Podcasts, or on iTunes. Subscribe, and that way you get the most up-to-date notifications about when we release new episodes or bonus content. So go ahead and do that. We also have a backlog of episodes. So if this is your first time listening, first of all, welcome. But also, if it is helpful, if if what we do here is helpful to you and is supportive to your walk in life and in faith, then I would encourage you go back and, and look at the previous episodes that we've done and see if maybe those can be helpful to you as well. This week, in particular, we will be discussing what it means to be in Christ. What it means to rest in Christ, what it means to just be. Which is a topic that is courtesy of the Red Letter Challenge. Typically, for those of you who regularly listen to the show, you would know that we take up topics submitted by listeners. You you submit a topic that you want to hear me talk about. You want to hear how maybe it intersects with our faith. And you submit it and then we talk about it. But for this walk through Lent, through this time of Lent, which is the 40 days that lead up to Easter, we are going to depart from that a little bit and we're going to talk about these topics of the Red Letter Challenge. So this, this week is being, B-E-I-N-G, And that is the topic at hand. If you want to hear different topics, though, feel free to still submit. I will add them to my my list and we will get to them. It'll just have to be after Lent. So as we get into our topic here, I, I want to define what I'm talking about when I say be in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? Because that is uh weird language. It sounds weird to say that we're in Christ. And what I'm primarily getting at here is this idea of spiritual discipline, of pushing ourselves, challenging ourselves to grow closer to Christ, to discipline ourselves in that way, in the same way that physical discipline is talking about maybe exercise or training your body. Uh, Mental discipline would maybe be your ability to focus or training your mind. Spiritual discipline is is a very similar thing for your spiritual life. So that's that's what I'm talking about as I'm going forward is this idea of spiritual discipline, this idea of drawing closer to Christ and being able to rest in that, being able to just be in that. That's what we're going to approach as we go forward. And why does this matter? I think one of the primary reasons this matters is that we all struggle with this as people. We love to earn our way. We, we want to do things. We like to be accomplishing tasks, goals, objectives, whatever you want to call them. We like to be doing things. We don't like to sit still. We don't like to be passive in our own lives. So this can be a bit of a challenge to us, so I think it's worth approaching and talking about as a challenge, because this idea that comes along with spiritual discipline is rest, and rest is is challenging to our existence. It's, It's contrary to a lot of the things that we regularly approach. So with all that being said, I do think this is an incredibly worthwhile topic to pick up, and that is real Jesus, real gospel. And giving it a title like that makes me think that maybe we should have approached this topic sooner, but it's okay because we're getting to it now. And as we always do, we, we approach this through Scripture, through the words of God that have been handed down to us. And I want to start today in Psalm, which I think is something we've done, Psalms, sorry, which is something we've done a, a couple times lately. And I have no problem with that. Psalm 27, 1 through 5 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter on the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. So just some quick textual notes on this. We have the psalmist again is talking about God. He's speaking about God and the things that he does in our lives and in the lives of, in the life of the psalmist. And the summary of this is that no matter what we do or don't do or, or what people do to us, God ultimately is going to work in the way that he wants to work. So... As we go forward, what this gives us is an Old Testament precedent to rely on God to do things on our behalf, to stand up against our enemies, to stand on our behalf. Even in the midst of these most dire circumstances that the psalmist talks about being faced with with warfare and with other incredibly difficult things, he says, I will be confident, I will stand secure in my God. And my, my response, as, as I want to direct this to our lives, is if we're willing to give things to God in dire circumstances, if we have a really difficult diagnosis from the doctor, if our family members are abroad, if we're struggling with something really significant, and we're willing to give that to God, to give that to God in prayer, why aren't we willing to give up the smaller things too? And that's kind of the question that I want to be in the back of our, our mind as we go forward in this discussion. And as we go, I want to go pretty directly into the text where he says, this one thing I ask for to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And a lot of people will say the house of the Lord because it sounds nice. It sounds religious. The house of the Lord. Without really thinking about what they mean when they say it. So I want to talk a little bit about what we, what I mean when I say house of the Lord and what we can understand that as now. You see, a lot of people will say, oh, the house of the Lord, that's church or temple or the temple or it's a place is what people want to get at. But I think if we look at Scripture, and if we look at the whole of Scripture, I don't think that's the place we're at anymore. You see, because when the temple was around, when sacrifices were made on behalf of the people to atone for their sins, the temple was the place where those sacrifices were made. It was a place where priests could intercede on behalf of the people for God. But we don't need that anymore because Christ is our great high priest and he directly intercedes on our behalf. So we don't have to go to some building to make our sacrifices, to make our intercessions. And what this really does is this expands the house of God to anywhere where his people are. So if, if you want to dwell in the house of God, you don't have to go to a church or a monastery you just have to be with God wherever you are. So this temple is everywhere. And it, as he describes what he wants to do in this temple, I think it's a good ideal for us to strive for. And that is, he wants to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. This is a passive thing. He's just watching. And I think this is where we're going to start into get, getting into what does it mean to be in Christ. What is this idea of being? And I think part of it is just watching how God works. Reflecting on how God has worked in your life and in the lives of his people throughout history. This is just admiration. This is just praise. It's 
very passive, very simple. And I think that's one way we be with God. And then he goes forward. What else does he want to do? He wants to inquire of of the Lord in his temple. This is seeking after God. So I think another aspect that we're getting at when we talk about being with God is that we want to be in his word. We want to seek after more understanding of him, whether that is devotions or just reading your Bible or worship these other spiritual disciplines that are a little bit more than just reflecting on what God has done. But they're still, they're centered on what God has done and not us doing our own thing. And in the midst of all of this, this is against our nature. We don't generally just sit and admire. The people I know who sincerely like to just sit and admire things are are very few. We like to do things. We like to be active in our own lives. And this is, this is a call to passivity. It, it's hard to just sit, wait, and watch God do his thing. It's hard to just be. This is a challenge for us. And that's the reality. The reality is being is a struggle. In a world where we love to do things, it is, it is a difficulty, it is a struggle to be. But the gospel is that God does invite us into this relationship, into his temple, to be with him. And as we go forward, we're going to talk about how that being with him is is a rest of sorts. And that's going to lead us into our gospel for today, that is Mark 6, where the apostles returned to Jesus. They told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. So textual notes, when it talks about desolate place, what they're talking about here is just a place that is away from the city. A place that is away from all of these crowds and these people and these things to do. It's a retreat of sorts. So what this is, is... Jesus approaching and inviting and taking the disciples to a place where they can be alone with him. Where they can be alone with God. So how does this reflect into our lives? And I think we can pretty easily extend that invitation to ourselves or that invitation is extended to us. Because we also have this opportunity, this invitation to rest with God. To take time out of our busy days and our busy lives to rest, whether that be in prayer or in devotion or listening to praise music, literally just sitting there and admiring all the things that God has done for you in your life, worship, all of these are different ways that we are invited to just rest in God, to just be with God. And yes, this does mean stepping away. If our days are filled to the brim with things to do, if we want to step away and be with God, that means we have to step away from something we're already doing, which is something we hate to do. And this is a piece of advice that I I would frequently give students as they were going into college because it's a struggle I faced. And I would tell them, I would tell them that if they didn't forcibly make time for their relationship with God, something else would take that time. Free time is not a reality. Let me say that again. Free time is not a reality. Nature abhors a vacuum. If you have time where you're not doing something, something is going to take that time from you. There's going to be a commitment that comes up. Someone's going to ask for something. You're going to go do something. So unless we do, we we are intentional about setting this time away from all the other things we do to be with God. It's, It's going to be impossible. So I think this text challenges us to go to that desolate place, to stop and rest and eat with our God. And the reality is, again, there is a struggle here because it means we're going to have to drop something or delegate something or pass something on. 
And I, I have to tell you, today I'm going through the Red Letter Challenge. I'm currently a day behind. But the, the challenge in that devotional series for today is take a half hour to go off by yourself with your Bible and just be. And I read that this morning and I thought, wow, that is going to be very difficult because I'm at work today and then I have a soccer match tonight and I have all these things going on. Just taking a half hour to be by myself, that's going to be tough. And I think that's a struggle that most of us share, this idea of just stepping out of everything we do in our lives to be with God. That is a struggle. And I'm right with you and and that being a struggle. So let's work on it. And if you want a strategy for working on it, I'd say start with a little bit. Say, I'm going to set aside five minutes today. And maybe tomorrow, if that five minutes goes well, maybe you set aside seven minutes. And you build that up. And that would be a strategy that I might recommend if, uh, take it for what it's worth. And that's the reality of this, is it is a struggle. But the real gospel and all of that is this is an invitation for rest. And God knows that we need a reprieve, we need this rest, so that's why he invites us into this rest. He invites us to just be with him, to rest with him. And that's, I think, where we can take hope out of this, because the disciples are out, they're busy doing things and and teaching and casting out demons and all these other things. And they come back to Jesus and they tell him, this is what we've been doing. And he doesn't immediately say, okay, go out and do more. He sees that they're tired, that they need to eat and rest. So he invites them to do so. He takes them away to a solitary place, to a place with just him. And he gives them that rest. And that is incredible. And speaking on that rest, that invitation for rest, it's going to bring us into our epistle, into our other New Testament reading for today that comes from Hebrews 4, where we're told, If Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore to strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So before I go forward and how this applies to us and how we're going to talk about this, I do want to mention a couple notes on the text I just read. We have... This character of Joshua, and for those of you who might be less familiar, Joshua is a leader in the Old Testament. He's a, the successor to Moses. He follows Moses in his leadership of Israel after the Exodus. He leads them into the Promised Land. So, that he's an Old Testament leader, and it's talking about some of the things he did. And then when it gets to this, this talk about Sabbath... That was a day of rest. It was set aside in the law of God as a day of rest. And this this passage from Hebrews, what it's really getting at is this reality that without rest, we are more prone to falter, to end up doing things we shouldn't do, which is a psychologically proven reality. And then it speaks, it finishes by saying that God's word accomplishes a lot of the things that we might rest from. God's word is living and active. So that's kind of where we're starting with our text. And as we go and how that affects our lives, how that reflects into our lives, we have this rest from works. You see, we don't have to work to earn our place in Christ's kingdom. And I think so much of the work that we push ourselves so hard to be in and involved with is because we're trying to justify ourselves. Whether that be through our employment, where we're trying to make enough money to say we can support ourselves, or the volunteer activities we might be involved with, trying to prove we're a good person, or 
the other things that we do just on a daily basis to try and show people something or to accomplish something for ourselves. And God gets that. God actually, he does command that. He has things that he has set before us to do. But if we look all the way back to Genesis, God created the world. And he went through that incredible task. But on the last day of creation, he rested. This is God Almighty. And he took a rest. And I think one of the reasons that he did that was to set an example for us. Because yes, we do have work in our lives. And we have tasks in front of us, but we're called to rest from those on a regular basis. And you see, at our core, we I think one of the reasons we push against that is because we, we're afraid that if we don't do the work, we're going to lose our justification. We're going to lose the relevance we had or the abilities we had or whatever. And what we're assured of here is that God is going to take care of all of that. We don't have to earn our way before him. So we can afford this rest and to take that time regularly. And this is where I want to get kind of really practical with you guys. And what does rest do? And what is setting aside a time, setting aside the time to be just you and God do? Well, psychologically speaking, It gives you much needed rest that you need to stay mentally healthy. If you are working and working and working, you, that does damage to your mental health. This past weekend, I went through a mental health first aid training. And one of the things that is an encouragement for those who struggle with their mental health to help support that is say, step back from some of your commitments step back, rest a little bit. So there is that psychological benefit. And there is also this reality that the more tired we are, the less rest we take advantage of, the more prone we are to mistakes and and breaking God's law and not doing what we ought to be doing. Which again, there's a lot of evidence to that. Because your your willpower, your decision-making capabilities, they degrade the longer you're using them without a break. So we have this, these very practical reasons why we need rest. But the other benefit we have from this kind of rest that I'm talking about is because it gives us an opportunity to get into God's word and into prayer and into these ways that we can grow closer to God, which only enhances our rest. It only enhances the benefits we feel from that because it is bringing us closer to the God that sustains us. So the reality of this text from Hebrews and these challenges it puts before us is that there is a reality of temptation, that we want to work toward our own good. We want to prove that we are enough in some way. And this is where God's word convicts us a little bit. It says, you're not enough, but I'm enough for you. Now rest. And I think that's where the gospel comes in because we already have the victory. We are enough. God has said we are enough because of his sacrifice for us. And we're invited to rest in that victory. God says, I have won the victory for you. Rest with me. Be with me. And then we're also promised here that the word continues to work. Even while we rest, even in the midst of our rest, the word continues to work. God's word continues to work. And that is incredible. So in conclusion for this whole episode, as we talk about what it means to just be with God, just be in God, the summary is really that we are called, we need time to step away and to be with God, to practice those spiritual disciplines I talked about at the beginning of the episode, whether that be prayer or Bible reading or devotion or solitary time between you and God listening to worship music, whatever you need to do. We're invited to that. We're called to that. And there are some strategies to that. And I would say, start with a little thing and then build it up. And that's, that's kind of my strategy as I am talking to you about this. And the real life reality, 
The reality of all of this is that it is an incredible struggle for us because it is hard to sit back and just be in a world that is so centered around doing. But the real gospel is that Christ gives us rest in the midst of that world, an incredible rest that only he can really give us. So we have, we, <laughs> we have nothing but thanks for him for that. So that's the conclusion of this episode on real rest, real Christ, real gospel. I hope it was helpful. I hope that maybe you can go forward in these ways and that it will improve your both your life and your relationship with God. Again, this has been Real Life, Real Gospel. We do release an episode every Thursday on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and YouTube. So check us out. Subscribe on all those pages. One more time, I've been your host, Vicar Josh, here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.